One other thing I want to yeah. ask you about on the microanatomy side, Andy, is uh, explain, you, you sort of have talked about it indirectly, but I, if, if a person hasn't maybe caught it, can you just explain how hypertrophy fits into this? So when a person wants to have bigger muscles, what's happening at the cellular level with their muscle fibers? Right. So there's an interesting um, discussion here. The, the easy answer is when we generally say hypertrophy, what we're referring to is diameter or cross-sectional area. And so if you remember, if you think about the muscle fibers being that cylinder, the width of the cylinder just expands. Mm -hmm. And so that circle gets larger is the way to think about it. Um, and, and, a, now, and a crude analogy is getting fatter means each adipocyte is getting bigger. It's taking on and storing more triglyceride. Yep. Yep, exactly. So from a skeletal muscle perspective, it, it, the diameter gets larger. Um, there's actually interesting work. We actually have some tissue on its way to Auburn right now. Because one of the things that's been interesting, it's like a bro science <laughs> thing for years of sarcoplasmic hypertrophy versus contractile hypertrophy. And so what this is really positing is, is the change really coming from fluid retention basically, or is it actually enhanced of the contractile tissue, which in this case would be an uh, actinomyosin. Um, seems to have some initial work there that's a little bit of both and it happens at different phases of training. Um, so Sorry, the is, the, is, is the question, do different types of training increase sarcoplasmic versus contractile hypertrophy? Or is the broader question, you know, hey, is a bodybuilder a bodybuilder because their sarcoplasmic reticulum is huge, but their contractile units are not that much bigger than the average person? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm going to make sure I understand the question. Yeah. So it's close, not the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's what we call sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Okay. So this would just be an increase in diameter with additional fluid intake. So it is close to what you're saying. Okay. So in other words, does this thing even exist? In other words, or is all increases in muscle size through strength training, assuming it's like a normal positive adaptation, that's yeah, yeah. sort of a weird thing. Is it actually happening because myosin and actin are getting thicker? I see. I got I mean, it. You can't okay. add actin. Wait, that's amazing. We don't know the answer to that question yet? We don't. More data have started coming out. Wow. But even a few years ago, the, the idea that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy was a thing was thought of as like garbage bro science. Meaning the idea, the, the, the sort of assumed belief was anytime muscles got bigger, they were getting bigger in the contractile units? Correct. Well, by the way, I'm not, but, I'm, not, I'm not shocked that that was the default hypothesis. I'm shocked that it wasn't definitively known. It was a, it was a technology issue. Okay. It was, a, it was an assay problem, mm -hmm. like figuring out how to actually measure this. Um, when you take a muscle fiber- Even with of, an electron like, microscopy, you couldn't do this? That, that's not the problem. It's the standardization of fluids. That's the issue. When you here, sample right? the, when so, you sample the tissue, it's how do you lock the fluid into place, basically? Correct. Yeah. How do you take this cell out of a living human and preserve it its some fluid dish. architecture? Yep. Without contaminating it, I got it. And you couldn't do that with like liquid nitrogen immediately. That flash freezes. Yeah. So if you get crystals in there, you actually lice. You screw the whole thing. Got it. So oh, beautiful. So what was just just because I'm such a freaking nerd, I can't stand it. How how did you guys solve this problem? Uh, well, I didn't solve it. Um, first of all, Mike Roberts out of Auburn, um, has produced a lot of really interesting work in this area. His labs is extraordinary. Um, but they just figured out they were able to kind of take an assay from a colleague of his, uh, figure out how to preserve it in liquid nitrogen is actually fine. Um, but then from there you have to thaw it correctly and you have to do it. So he, he troubleshot this whole thing for a couple of years. I see. So liquid, you accept the crystals that'll blow up the size because of course the if dense, you freeze them correctly yeah but yeah. it's it's how you thought it that uh yeah oh, yeah God. so 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 cool. Hard. so cool <laughs> like this so it gets very detailed but mike well, I, you and i hope there's some high school college kid listening to this who's studying chemistry who's realizing just how cool and interconnected all of these worlds are you know chemistry biology physics they're just so linked yeah yeah i, I always joke that like there's only one thing in this world there's only one science it's just math like as much as I hate math, the chemistry is math, energy is math. Like it's all just biomechanics is math. Like it's just, hmm. it's that math and reductionism, but that's it. Those are two things. Um, yeah. So to go back, uh, what the question is, and here, here's the, like where the exercise scientist cam comes in. Why is it a bodybuilder can have more muscle 
yet they're not stronger than a strong man or a weightlifter. Like how is this actually happening? And this is where this whole thing comes about. Like how is it that my hypertrophy can exceed yours, but somehow your strength? And, and the, the easy like sophomore answer is all oh, neurological adaptations. Okay, fine. Sure, but like there's, there's nothing happening intracellularly. Well, I don't think that's correct. Um, and in fact, it, it doesn't look to be the case. And so there is some sort of combination because here's the, here's the juxtaposition. There's a thing called lattice spacing, which is there's an optimal distance between that myosin and actin. In other words, if I was trying to produce a powerful contraction, but I was buttered up next to each other, I can't actually squeeze that hard because there's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. If I'm too extended, then I actually can't. Yeah, it's, it's the same idea as preload in a heart, right? Which is... 100%. Yeah. Preload is going to determine stroke volume, like everything in coming in, right? So this spacing, if you're going to start adding contractile units one way or the other, you have to preserve spacing somehow. That's and so the so kind of the idea, yeah, the idea is it will exceed, it will expand hypertrophically. But if it actually compromises the your, because there, there, there ha, going back to math, I promise you there's a mathematical optimization for the exact strike distance between actin and myosin to not be overextended or underextended and to have that perfect preload for maximum contraction. And if your hypertrophy 100%. train, I'm, this is now I'm totally making this up, but if your hypertrophy training interfered with that and compromised it, you might gain size at the expense of potential strength. Right. Or if that hypertrophy was coming simply from excessive fluid and not actually contracting it, mm -hmm. then you would actually have a larger muscle. And, and um, when I say fluid retention, I'm not talking about like acute fluid retention. I'm not saying like you're bloated today, you've water loaded. I mean, just there's there's enhanced fluid in a homeostatic balance inside the tissue because diameter has gotten larger, but it wasn't met with an equal amount of increase in contractile units. So if that number gets off. Yeah, I think another physiologic point that's worth explaining to people is how much people are familiar with the idea that two thirds to 70% of our weight, right? I stood on the scale this morning. Like that number on the scale, two thirds to 70% of it is H2O. And then people say, okay, well, wait, how can that be? Because I get that my blood plasma is water. That can't be where it all is. No, most of it yeah. is in the cells of our body. And the muscle is, of course, no exception, given yep. that it's that, such a ubiquitous cell. Totally. And in fact, given that it occupies the vast majority of mass in your body.